This first piece, you know, sounding, is not a piece for a film. It was not composer for a film, if not for the opening of Walt Disney Concert Hall. And it's an amazing piece. It's a piece full of colors, full of uh, smells. I, I, I can, when I'm conducting, I can feel, you know, that it's smell of nature coming around. And I know that the Disney Hall is such an inspiring place, but I want to know what was your inspiration about this piece? The first impression that you have, at least mine, is that Frank Gehry, who has made this building, uh, created these shapes that look like sails, you know, and, and the ship. My idea for writing some music to celebrate the hall was to try to excite the sound of the sails. If you can imagine you, a big piece of metal like that and you just touch it and it goes boom like this and makes a beautiful sound and speaks to you. So the experience I hope for the audience is that they will feel that the whole, the entire ambience of the building, the orchestra and all of that is, is one element. I always think about halls, they are instruments. It's like an Stradivari or a Guarneri. It's kind of the instrument of the orchestra, the instrument of the music to became alive. I love what you say about halls, Gustavo, mm -hmm. because a hall is a partner. Mm -hmm. You put the orchestra in one room, it has a character. You put it mm -hmm. in another room, another hall, it has another character. The, the hall is like what's inside the violin that we excite and bring out. So it is a partner with us in exactly. making the sound. Your music is so rich, so rich in, in beauty, in so many elements, you know. What was, you know, your beginnings, your childhood, everything that I, I preceded feel, that? I feel, Gustavo, as you must feel, that, that I was very fortunate as a kid for the influences that I had and the opportunities that other people may not have had. Mm -hmm. My father was a professional musician. He worked in the CBS Orchestra <clears throat> in, in New York City in, oh. in the 1930s and 40s. His friends were all musicians in the orchestra. So I thought when you grew up, you became a musician. That's the only thing, the only kind of adult <laughs> exactly. that, I, that I knew. Exactly. And he used to take me to the radio rehearsals occasionally. I would sit there eight, 10 years old. And of course I wanted to do that and try to do, learn, learn from these things. So my life is probably in many ways very similar to yours, Gustavo, because I grew up in the ambience of yeah. music and so I had so many opportunities because of my parents to have good teachers, to have an opportunity to play here, to write there, and so on, that other children would never have. have. Yes, so I certainly have had a very good and very fortunate start. John uh, invited me one day to, in, uh, at the Sony Studios to, to conduct your studio orchestra mm -hmm. at that time, no? Yeah. That you were recording Tan Tan. That's right. Tin Tin. It's amazing how it works perfectly. So how was the inspiration of that? When I was a little kid, I used to go to the movies, not often, but I loved the action movies and I loved the swashbuckling and sword fighting because I always thought, ah, that's the most exciting music. Usually the scherzando yeah. mode, you know, very quickly, and the choreography. And in my career as a composer, Gustavo, in film, I have very few opportunities for this kind of swashbuckling action. And so in Tanta, Steven Spielberg film, I have an opportunity to do just that. If I don't read a script, I'm very happy because I look at this director's cut, I don't know what's happening next. And I'm bored or I'm excited, and I need to have that memory when I write. I think this is a, maybe a boring moment. <laughs> maybe I can do something there, uh, exactly. in the sound of this thing that will improve the situation. So for me, the first thing is the rhythm of the film. And then with character and texture and exactly. style and all the other endless elements mm -hmm. that go into it. But a director's cut is an invaluable thing for me. It would be wonderful if we hear some music and we say, it could, only be, it could be only belong to that film. It's not always possible no. to get that kind of uh, curve in the sculpture, you know, but we try. I did have an experience with Steven Spielberg at the end of E.T. where music was about 10 minutes for the last reel. Children are chasing, uh, escaping from police and so on very quickly. And I, I made several takes and I could not make it fit the film. The orchestra was playing away and I tried to do timing and you know how difficult oh, yes. it can be. 
So finally, Stephen said, we'll turn the film off. We just play the music the way you want to play it, and I will re-edit the film to it, which he did. I wish I could do it all the time. It would make life, <laughs> make life a lot easier. But I also, when I look at that scene now, I think some, there's something sort of operatic about the way the orchestra was playing it, mm -hmm. that they were let free to go. Free they weren't watching me to what's coming the next cue. We would just play the, you know. And I think it gave some luft, lift to the, to the final scene. The performance of the orchestra animates the film in a way that film cannot live without music. It's true, it really cannot. We try, you take the film away and it looks dead, whatever. The, mm -hmm. the, I think it's safe and correct to say that. When we planned this evening at Disney Hall, Gustavo said, I would love to conduct Catch Me If You Can. Yes, I said, well, fantastic, if you want to do that. It is true, when I was very young, I used to play in jazz groups and so on. Nothing, I'm not, not, I would put it this way, not a major league jazz player, but I played with some very good and very talented people. In the 50s and 60s, way back, and the spirit of this film was in the 1960s, the story was there, and I look at the film and I thought, ah, that would be a perfect vehicle for this kind of 1960s style particularly for saxophone. The young saxophonists in those days all worshipped Charlie Parker. I don't know if you remember him. Yeah. Charlie Bird Parker, who instructed the whole generation of young saxophonists how to play this fantastic music. In writing that music, it was natural and happy for me to try to recreate some of the memories I have had and also the graphics in the film, meaning to say the graphic credits and so on, had a kind of suspicious, mysterious style mm. that was created by a man named Saul Bass. People may not remember the name, but all these wonderful geometrics that he did in the 60s. Now it looks very into that old style. Yeah. So it seemed like that music, Charlie Parker saxophone music, and the visual art of Saul Bass put together would make sense. The music create this kind of mysterious feeling, you know, and, uh, so this kind fine. of personality yeah. that you don't know, okay. and you don't know if they will catch, you know, <laughs> yeah. this this person and his first bars, you know, pa, pa -da, pa -da -da -di, you know, one, two, <laughs> yeah. three, and then shh, yeah, yeah. this kind of mysterious, anxious also because he's sometimes the. The anxious feeling is not coming with an accelerando or with a fast tempo, no. Sometimes it's hmm. the silence. That's right. And this creation from the silence, pa, para, then three, and then it gets, you and know, to the jazz. Uh, dramatically, yeah. musically and dramatically, something quiet mm -hmm. can be very threatening. Very, you know, very, very frightening. So we don't always have to be loud and big. We yeah. can suggest and insinuate something that is a threat yeah. by just a word well, or a note. Like yours. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, the yeah. you know, like <laughs> the that. silly yeah. thing, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. 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 That kind of getting simo and, yeah, and getting scary. faster yeah. or faster, but only two notes. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. amazing. That's enough. <laughs> it's enough, exactly. <laughs> Fiddler on the Roof, we all remember now, was a filmed version of the, of the Broadway show. And when we moved to the film area, there were expansive uh, sections that needed music that were not provided in the score, the Jerry Box score. With his permission, we were able to do that. The thing that we would hear has to do with the opening of the film, where there were contractual requirements to put the director's name, the photographer's name, the actor's name, all of this five, six, seven minutes of screen time, which of course doesn't exist in the, in the Broadway show. Norman Jewison said, well, we have the idea we will have a fiddler on the roof like the Chagall painting, and we will see him. It won't be Chagall, but we will see the fiddler, and this, we will fiddle away for six minutes. Okay, so I have to, so I've made a cadenza and a series of little variations, which mm -hmm. you do, and some, some elaborations and so on, another little mini cadenza at the end of this thing, to accompany this stretch of film. I remember having a discussion with Norman Jewis and the director, who can we get to play the violin? And I said, well, you know, I, Isaac Stern, I think he said, you think he would play it? And I said, if you call him, I think he would agree to do it. There were also other little sequences in the film, uh, write some music for Isaac to play, which he did in this wonderfully charismatic, you know, Hebraic style. It was so perfect for the, the texture of the thing that he did so beautifully. So that was my, my wonderful opportunity there.
Steven Spielberg made a beautiful movie, which most people will remember. Mm -hmm. And in one of the early scripts, it called for a violinist to play a Jewish gentleman entertaining the German officers in, in an officers club. And the scene, alas, was not used. But because it was part of the original plan, I said to Stephen, we have to have a violinist to do this thing. So I asked Itzhak Perlman if he would come and do it, and he said yes. Knowing I was writing these notes for Itzhak Perlman, knowing his sound, I, it really led me, I think, where I hoped where I needed to go. I had known him for 20 years or more, Itzhak. Every time I saw him, this is before the film, he would say, John, when are you going to have a film that I can play the violin? <laughs> Every time I see him. So finally, this came along, she listened, I called up and I said, Itzhak, I have a film for, that you will be interested in. Oh, I don't know, I don't think I want to do a film. <laughs> so, yeah. I said, I think you should look at this thing, maybe it's exactly. something you should want to do. He came crazy. So he came up to Boston, we record Symphony Hall with the orchestra there, and he looked a little bit of the film and he just, he couldn't, it's so emotional, some of the scenes in there. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to look at it to rehearse, he said, we'll just play, I don't want to see it. No. He brought his great art to the film, and, uh, which embraces his feeling, his history, his all of, all of it. You know, so he is a. It is the film, it is the music, it is his voice. Um, it suggests so much rich history of all of the all of the story. All of us, we have an influence. You know, in life. You have been, you know, an inspiration for me and for many composers, uh, um, uh, new young composers for film and for, and, for, and for music in general. But for you, your inspirations, your role models, you know, in your times and with the people that you work. I became fascinated and have a love affair, had love affair with orchestra itself mm -hmm. as an instrument to deliver music when I was very, very young, in large part because of the fact that I would go to the movies and hear an orchestra, which I wouldn't have heard in a concert until later. So I think that's the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I would see names on the screen. It would say music by Alfred Newman. And 20 years later or so, I was studying music and playing here, and I was employed by Alfred Newman in his studio to play in his orchestra. Can you wow. imagine? So it was like a dream for me. And also Bernard Herrmann, who conducted and I played in his orchestra. So I knew these men from really childhood and was so fortunate to be introduced to them and be able to play for them a number of years in their, in their scores. By osmosis, so to say, I have imbibed or digested this kind of sound of the orchestra. Others, I mean, Franz Waxman, I worked for him, also Dmitry Tiamkin, who was remembered for scores. And I would begin to do orchestration for some of them. Mr. Tiamkin said, his famous old film, Guns of Navarone, very many years ago, mm -hmm. will I, me, I play orchestra, would you orchestrate some seconds? So I would, sections for him. So that was another step closer from the piano to the orchestra to eventually opportunity to conduct a little bit. But I still have my love affair with the orchestra, which comes to us from two or three hundred years of evolution. Exactly. It's a precious a gift to us that we have inherited. Yeah. And we have learned to manipulate strings, winds, brass, percussion all together, you know, from earlier masters, and we do our own, make our own efforts. That's our life, and that's what we love.